Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, lecture five, which is going to cover um, some cell biology and some cellular transport. So let's get right into it. OK, so all organisms are composed of cells. And we talked about that when we talked about organizational levels in a previous lecture. OK, all of these cells are responsible for structural and functional properties of an organism. Um, we need to understand this to understand how the human body works, how disease uh, infects us and how we deal with those um, diseases with therapies and medicines and things like that. OK, so the term cytology, which could be uh, its own course um, by itself, is the scientific studies of cells. And we have this idea that we call the cell theory. And the cell theory states that all organisms are composed of cells and cell products. OK, so all living things are composed of cells, no matter if it's one cell or if it's many cells. OK, actually should be more than one. OK, um, the cell is the simplest structural and functional unit of life. OK, there is nothing uh, smaller than a cell that is alive. An organism's structure and functions are due to the activities of these cells. Right. So if these cells don't function properly, OK, the activities of that organism don't function properly. Cells come only from pre-existing cells. So it's kind of you have to ask yourself a question, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? OK, um, so a cell had to come from another cell. But where did that first cell come from? OK, that's something to think about. But all cells that um, are made now come from pre-existing cells. Uh, cells of all species exhibit uh, biochemical similarities. So uh, humans and plants and jellyfish all do cellular respiration in a very, you know, in the same way. All these chemical, uh, biochemical uh, reactions are the same and they can go across the board no matter what type of uh, living thing you're talking about if it's a bacteria or a or a human being whatever okay. so what we want to do now is we want to take a look at the different um, parts of the cell uh, we call the different parts of a cell organelles okay organ l's okay l's means small OK, so this is small organs. OK, now these organs make up the, the interior or they're held within the interior of a cell and they all have different functions and they have different shapes. And we want to take a look at that now. All right. So the first thing we want to look at is the plasma membrane, which could also be called the cell membrane. And I have pictures of all these, so I'm not going to do too much drawing because I'm going to show you the pictures. OK, but we're just going to go through the simple functions of these. This is, again, just a review of biology. OK, so the cell membrane or the plasma membrane could be interchanged, surrounds the cell. OK, it defines the boundaries of the cell. So you can see where one cell begins and another one ends. OK, it's made of proteins and lipids. And we're going to see that uh, more closely. The interior of the cell, so that's the outside. The interior of the cell is full of something called cytoplasm. And cytoplasm has um, two basic portions, right? You have the liquid portion. And you have the solid portion. OK, the liquid portion is called cytosol. And the solid portions are called the organelles. OK, so the liquid portion is the cytosol. The solid portions are organelles. When you add them together, you get cytoplasm. OK, it's kind of like your blood. Your blood has a liquid portion called plasma. The solid portions are your red blood cells and platelets and white blood cells. You add them all together, you call it blood right here. We call the cytosol plus the organelles that are within the cytosol. We call that the cytoplasm. OK. There's fluid um, inside and outside the cell or the fluid that sits between cells. We call that uh, interstitial fluid. OK, so you'll have spaces between cells. So here's one cell. It'll be next to other cells and there's spaces in between and all the spaces in between are filled with what we call interstitial fluid. <clears throat> OK, so this is a picture of a very typical cell. And there's lots of different things in here that are going on. And you can see all of them lined up here on either side. We're not going to learn every single one of these, but we're going to learn a good portion of them. OK, uh, and we're basically going to keep referring back to these pictures over and over. But you can see the uh, cell membrane OK, here running along of one cell. You can see the cell membrane of the other cell on the opposite side. OK, same thing. It runs around the whole thing. This is this looks like a 
what we call a cuboidal cell, okay, which looks like a cube. Okay, but we'll talk about that more when we get to tissues and things like that. But all of these little things are called organelles. This big purple is, thing is an organelle. These squiggly lines are organelles. These little orange things, the threads, okay, all of these are organelles. And we want to learn what they all do because they all function together. It's kind of like a human body, right? You have the cardiovascular system, the brain, the nervous system, the tegumentary system. All these things have to work together in order for the organism to work properly. But the cell is very similar and right? has all these little pieces that do different jobs that are going to cause the cell to work properly so that the organ can work properly so that the organism can work properly. Okay. So once again, the plasma membrane borders the cell. Um, it defines the boundaries. It governs interactions with other cells. So if other cells uh, communicate with it, that's where the communication is going to begin. And this is going to be really important. It controls materials that go in and out of the cell. Okay, that's a really important idea with the plasma membrane. And we call that transport. And we're going to talk about that more later in this lecture. Okay. Here is a uh, actual microscope image of two cells. So we have a cell up here, which you only see a portion of. And then we have a cell down here, which we see a portion of. So if we were to draw these out, you know, this, this cell might go like this and this other cell would be up here somewhere. Maybe it might be a plant cell, it might be a human cell, don't really know, it doesn't tell us. Okay, but it's two different cells. And what it's showing you is that here are the membranes between two cells next to each other. So here's one plasma membrane or one cell membrane. Here's another cell membrane. There's a tiny little white, well, you know, lit area in between. And that's called the intercellular space where that interstitial fluid would be. And this is the in inside of this cell. This is the inside of this other cell. And this yellow stuff is going to be all my cytoplasm. This is going to be a nucleus, which is one of the organelles that's in the, it's in the cell. But that's just showing you a, a real image under a microscope of what the cell membrane looks like. Okay, here's another uh, very detailed diagram of the cell membrane. Okay, and we're going to see that it's composed of certain things, right? This, this cell membrane goes around the entire cell. Don't forget that, okay? So this is, this is what the membrane looks like if you, you know, were to cut it in half and look into it. But this goes around the entire cell. And you see that we have two layers, okay? And we're going to, this, this might be in the notes as well as I go along, but we have two layers, okay? And these little circles with these little tails make up the two layers. So we have an outer layer here. And we have an inner layer on this side, right? So we have our inner layer, we have an outer layer, okay? These are made of certain types of lipids, okay? Um, each one of these little circles with little legs on them, these are called phospholipids, okay? So it's lipids with uh, phosphates attached to them. This purple, uh, the circle is a phosphate and these little legs are, are lipids. And they, it's a two-layer system, right? So you have this one layer here, this other layer here. They point at each other, kind of with the, with the lipids. And this causes a phospholipid bilayer. That's what we call the, the two layers, right? So we don't want to call it that. We want to call it a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so the majority of your cell membrane are these phospholipids in this bilayer. But then you have other things in the embedded in the membrane. These big purple things are called proteins. Okay, they can be, there's different types of proteins, which we're going to see a little bit later, uh, that do different jobs, but they're all embedded in there, into the cell membrane, so that things can pass through uh, when the cell wants it to pass through. But this idea of phospholipids making our membrane is very important, uh, especially when we talk about transport in a little bit. Okay, so here's, here's your uh, info about uh, phospholipids, 98% of the membrane are our lipids, okay? 75% um, of that 98% are called phospholipids, like I just told you, okay? Forms in a bilayer, okay? Now there are two words that we need to know, hydrophilic and hydrophobic, okay? The phosphate and our lipids. So this is the phosphate. This is my lipid tails, okay? The phosphate part is hydrophilic. Okay, hydrophilic. They like water. Okay, and they're exposed. 
Okay, if this is a cell, the outside would be the phosphates and the inside would be the phosphates, right? So the outside is touching interstitial fluid, right? That's watery fluid, that's water-based fluid. And on the inside of the cell, we have all of our cytoplasm and that's made mostly of water. So that's hydrophilic too. So we want these phosphates to be pointing towards water uh, because they're hydrophilic. They like water, they like to be around water. But the tails, these tails are hydrophobic. Okay, hydrophobic means that they dislike water. So we don't want these tails pointing at anything water-based. So if we go back, um, a slide here. Okay. And I erase all of this stuff. Okay. Um, we could see that, you know, this extracellular fluid here, this is mostly water and we have our phosphates uh, pointing towards that water. And in here we have intracellular fluid or our cytoplasm, right? Our cytosol. And that's mostly water as well. So we want these phosphate molecules pointing towards the water areas. Okay. We don't want these lipids pointing towards the water areas because they don't like water, right? If you ever had um, oil and vinegar dressing, okay, you can see what happens when oil and, and vinegar and, are in contact with each other, they repel each other. So we don't want that in our cells. We don't want our cells repelling the water around us. We want it to be able to sit in that water, okay? Um, other lipids that are in the membrane, you have cholesterol, okay? Uh, they can hold and stiffen those phospholipids so that they are a little bit more protective. You have things called glycolipids. Uh, glyco means sugar. Okay, anytime you see glyco means sugar or starch or carb. Okay, and then lipid means fat. So it's a sugar fat mixture. It's a sugar fat combo. Okay. Uh, these are gonna contribute to coating the cell surface. Okay, making it. And then we have um, proteins. Okay, we have lots of proteins in the cell membrane. That's what those big purple things were. When we look at the picture, these big purple things are um, membrane proteins, and they can have lots of different uh, functions. They can be receptors, which means they can uh, accept chemical uh, messages. Uh, they can be messengers themselves, so they can they can send a message from one part of the cell to another. They can be used as enzymes to break things apart, right? When we talked about chemical reactions, we uh, talked about enzymes being able to break things apart or put them together. They can be channels, which means something can pass through it. They can be carriers. Um, they can be cell identity markers. That's how we uh, make vaccines, especially the, the COVID-19 vaccine, by using cell um, markers or spike proteins that are found on viruses. Okay, they could be adhesion molecules, which means that um, there are certain proteins that are going to help cells stick together or stick to the uh, neighboring cells so that they stay a nice strong tissue. Okay, here are pictures of some of them. Okay, so here's an example of like a receptor. And this, uh, this is a triangle here is a little chemical messenger. Maybe that chemical messenger came from a pancreas or maybe it came from a liver. Okay, and it wants a certain cell to do something. So that chemical message gets sent out and certain cells are gonna have receptors for that particular message and it can fit inside the protein. And once that um, message goes into the protein, that receptor can then tell the rest of the cell what to do or what's needed because of that message. Okay, here's an enzyme example. So it's taking a large molecule, turning it into a whole bunch of smaller molecules, right? It's breaking it apart. Here's a channel protein. Okay, it's kind of like a, a doggy door on a, on a house, all right, it lets things pass through the membrane, okay, or even leave the membrane, okay. We have something called a gated channel, which is very similar, just a little bit more difficult to get in and out of, and we'll talk about that later too. Okay, we have cell identity markers, right, so this is a marker, all right, so every cell is gonna be different, all right, so your white blood cells have different markers than your red blood cells, which have different markers than your um, immune cells or your skin cells, your liver cells, right? All your different cells have different markers on them to tell what they are, okay? And here's a cell adhesion molecule, okay, CAM. Okay, it's going to allow it to connect to a neighboring cell. Okay, and we want that to be a nice strong bond. Okay, there are some extensions to the cell membrane, which means things that come off of the cell membrane, right? Um, one of them are is called micro, uh, I'm sorry, cilia. Okay, cilia, which are like little hair-like processes that come off of the um, cell membrane. They could be used like as antenna, 
to monitor the conditions of the environment around them. Okay, uh, your inner ear has a lot of cilia to give you balance. Okay, your eyes okay, have cilia inside them um, to detect light in the retina. Okay, you also have these in the nose for sensory organs, for your, for, uh, your olfactory nerves. Okay, so these cilia are important and they are extensions of the cell membrane. Uh, so we can see them here. Okay, these little microvilli, these cilia here. Okay, so this would be the surface of a cell. Now, like little like finger-like projections that come off of the, excuse me, that come off of the cell membrane. Uh, if you take a look here, here you're looking at a cross section. Here you're looking at more of a bird's eye view. So these extensions are coming off this way instead of going up like we see them in this picture, but it's the same idea. Okay, here are some more uh, pictures of cilia. Cilia coming off the ends here. They're very, very tiny. Okay, but the idea of these is also, you know, to increase surface area. Okay, we want to increase the surface area of the cell as well. But it can also help to move. It can help to do lots of different things. Okay, another extension that we have is um, a flagella. Okay, flagella. There's only one cell in the entire human body that has a flagella, and that is the male sperm cell. Okay, that uh, flagella is going to act like a whip or a, or a tail, and it's going to help to move that sperm in whatever direction it, it, it wants to swim in. Okay, whenever it's looking for an ova, whenever it's looking for an egg, it uses that, that flagella to move itself around. Okay, then you have things called pseudopods. Pseudo means false. Pod means foot. So it literally is a false foot, and it helps the the organism, whatever has this or, uh, pseudopod on it, to move around. Okay, you see this a lot in like um, algal cells or uh, protists, things like that. Okay, but it is used for locomotion and even sometimes capturing particles that are in the vicinity of it. Okay, these are pseudopods. Right, whoops, I'm gonna go. Do that again. Okay, here we can see it capturing particles. Here we can like look at it as almost like tiny feet that help it move around. They're not actual feet, but they can attach to things and help move around on those pseudopods. Okay, now we're gonna go inside the cell. So we've, we've dealt with the membrane and extensions of the membrane. So now we wanna go deep, deeper inside of the cell. So when you go inside the cell, there is a framework of fibers that helps to keep the cell um, from deflating or keep the cell from imploding on itself. Um, and that's called the cytoskeleton. Okay, the cytoskeleton is a network of proteins um, that's gonna help give the cell its shape, right? We, we don't want our cells to be um, too mushy, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, we want our cells to have a nice internal structure. It's like if you had a building, right? You don't want it to just be a facade. You want it to have beams that structurally support that building inside um, so you can have floors and ceilings and things like that without the, the the building you know shaking and falling over the cytoskeleton is like that for a cell it's composed of these things called microfilaments um, microtubules and intermediate fibers okay and it's gonna help give that cell structure and support okay and we can see those threads look at all those tiny little green threads that are going through in different directions throughout this uh, in, inside of the cell here. Not these big red ones. I mean, the big red ones are, are gonna be microtubules as well, okay? So these big red ones, these little green ones, those are the cytoskeletons. Okay, again, microfilaments, microtubules, these are all going to be um, things that give the cell its shape, okay? Shape, hold organelles, okay? Organelles are gonna um, be held in place by these uh, microtubules, these the cytoskeleton. Okay, uh, things can actually walk across them, like almost like railroad tracks. Okay, we can, there's there's a really cool video out there that, that has like 3D imaging, of, or it's like a rendition, it's like an animation that shows you these things that have, how they think, how scientists believe they walk around on top of these uh, microfilaments. It's pretty cool. Okay, these are just pictures of microtubules. You can see that they are made of something called tubulin, which is a protein. Okay, and these can be used uh, for structure. They can also be used for things to get around. Okay, so let's now get to the nitty gritty. If, the, if you look at the very center of any cell, 
you'll see what we call a nucleus. Okay. Um, now this is any cell that's um, eukaryotic. Okay. Not bacteria. Bacteria don't have a nuclei. Anything that's eukaryotic has a nucleus. We are eukaryotic cells. Plants are eukaryotic cells. Algae, protists, um, we're all gonna, and fungus. We're all going to have nuclei. Okay. Uh, mitochondria, lysosomes, parts. We're going to learn about all these in a minute. Okay. What the difference is between this group and this group is that group number one here contains membranes. Okay. So a nucleus has a membrane, a mitochondria has a membrane, lysosomes, peroxisomes, all of these in this group have membranes and these do not. What's that mean? That means that they have an outer covering similar to the cell membrane, right? So you have the cell membrane here that contains the entire cell, but then you have the nucleus. The nucleus has its own membrane that's made of the same phospholipids that the cell membrane is made of, and it surrounds it. Mitochondria. Mitochondria have a cell mem uh, a membrane around it, a mitochondrial membrane, that is exactly like the cell membrane, made of phospholipids. Lysosomes, peroxisomes, endoplasmic reticulum. All of these organelles here have their own membranes that are identical to the cell membrane, but it surrounds each individual. Okay. Ribosomes do not. Centrosomes do not. Centrioles do not. Okay, these organelles do not have membranes that surround them. Okay, and that, that's important when you're talking more about general biology because only eukaryotic cells have membrane bound organelles, and only prokaryotic cells have non membrane bound organelles, like a bacteria. A bacterial cell only has these things, a bacterial cell will not have any of these. Okay. It will not have any of the membrane bound organelles. So you won't find a nucleus inside of a bacteria. You won't find a mitochondria inside of a bacteria. Okay. So it's, that's what, that's why that's important. That's why I bring it up. Okay. So let's look at these. What is the nucleus? Oh, I did it again. Okay. What is the nucleus? The nucleus is going to be the largest organelle in the cell. Um, most cells only have one nuclei, but we're going to find that there are some that have more than one. And the nucleus holds your genetic information. It holds your DNA. Okay. All your genetic information or your hereditary information will be found in the nucleus. The nucleus is surrounded by a membrane that we call the nuclear envelope. Okay. It is a double membrane, just like, you know, the lip, uh, phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Same exact thing. Okay. And this envelope has pores, which are little holes, right? So if we take a look at the nuclear membrane, it has these little pores all around it. Okay. And that those pores allow um, things to go in and out of the nucleus. Okay. Sometimes we need to get things in. Sometimes we need to get things out. Um, and it can go through those pores, whatever it needs to get in. Sometimes enzymes need to go in there. Sometimes proteins need to come out of there or go into there. Okay. Depending on what's being done in the actual cell. Okay, so here's a picture of the nucleus. Okay, this big purple ball is the nucleus. Okay, um, they've cut it open here so you can see inside of it. And we'll talk about what's inside of it in a minute. Okay, but the purple ball is the nucleus. These little circles here, those are my nuclear pores of the nuclear membrane. This entire thing is the nucleus. This outer membrane that surrounds the nucleus is the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane. And it has these little holes, which are called pores. Inside, you have chromatin. And chromatin is your DNA. Okay, it's your DNA in a like, um, like a very stringy form, almost like if you if you think of like a bowl of spaghetti. Okay, um, that's what chromatin is. It, it's it's DNA that's kind of unwound. Okay, unwound DNA. Okay. Here, this dark purple circle is called the nucleolus. That's very important. Okay, the nucleolus is at the very center of the nucleus, and it's going to create, that's where our ribosomes are gonna be made. And we'll talk about what a ribosome is later, but all the ribosomes that you have are made in the nucleolus. Remember that for later. Okay, the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, the endoplasmic reticulum is another organelle Okay, which is a series of channels uh, enclosed by a membrane. And we're going to have two types of 
endoplasmic reticulum. We've called it ER for endoplasmic reticulum instead of just saying it over again. Okay. We have two types. We have the rough ER. And on the next slide, we have the smooth ER. Okay. What makes it rough and what makes it smooth? Uh, the fact that ribosomes are present, which are these little dots that we're going to see on the ER. That's what we call the rough ER. Okay. We call the smooth ER smooth because it does not have um, any ribosomes on it. So what's the what's the point of the rough endoplasmic reticulum? What to do? It's a site or a place for protein synthesis. And what does that mean? That means the production or making of proteins. Okay, it's a site for protein synthesis. Okay, that's where protein synthesis is going to happen. Why are ribosomes important? Ribosomes are the things that synthesize proteins. Okay, so ribosomes are going to make proteins in this rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have ribosomes. Okay, that's important. Okay, it does not have ribosomes. That's why we call it smooth. And the main function of this is to make phospholipids. Okay, creates phospholipids. Okay, the same phospholipids that are that make up your cell membrane and the membranes of all those other organelles, the nucleus, mitochondria, all those other things, those membranes are going to come from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, right? So when you when your cell divides and makes more cells, it has to make more organelles, it has to make more mitochondria, it has to make more nuclei. Well, where do the membranes for those things come from? Right here. Okay, it comes from that smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here are the ERs. Okay, here is the rough ER. This is the smooth ER. You can tell because this one is uh, littered with ribosomes. This one is not. Okay, so here is where our protein synthesis is going to be. PS, protein synthesis. Here is where our phospholipids are going to be made. Okay, and they are channels, right? Things can pass and travel through these things. Okay, and let's see if I can go back to another picture. Let's see, where is my original picture here? Right here. Okay, so here's our nucleus. Okay, and the rough ER and the smooth ER are always going to be the first thing outside the nucleus. So here's the nuclei right here. Here is my uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum here, this big piece, and it's directly connected to the nucleus. Okay, because things that come out of the nucleus, the, in, the instructions that come out of the nucleus go right into the rough ER so that the ribosomes on the rough ER can look at those instructions and make proteins, right? That's what the nucleus does. The nucleus is uh, the boss that tells the rough ER what, um, what proteins to make or tells the ribosomes what proteins to make. So when that message comes out of the nucleus and goes into the, directly into the rough ER, the rough ER can then give that message to the ribosome and the ribosome can then make the protein. Here, this section here, without those little dots all over it, that's the smooth ER. Okay, so that's the smooth ER or this is the rough ER. Okay. Go back. Okay. Ribosomes. Okay. Ribosomes, these do not have any membranes on them, right? They are um, completely bare of membranes. They're small granules of protein and, and RNA. Where can they be found? They can be found in the, nucle uh, in the nucleoli. They can be found in the cytosol. So we have different types of ribosomes. We have free floating ones, free floating. And those ribosomes can be found in the, in the cytoplasm. And then we have attached ribosomes, which are found on the ER. Okay, they're found on the endoplasmic reticulum. What do they do? They read messages. What kind of messages? Genetic messages. Okay, and what do we call in science? We call a genetic message messenger RNA. And we'll talk about that more as we um, get through this, but we call it mRNA. And the M is lowercase, RNA is uppercase. The M stands for messenger, right? So these are little messages from the nucleus to the ribosome. And these little messages are read by the, here's my little ribosome, and here's my little message from the, from the, from the nucleus. And this little message, let's say this little message says insulin. 
The ribosome reads the message. Here's my ribosome. The ribosome reads the message and then spits out insulin. Okay, here's a little message. It's the, it's the directions to make insulin. The ribosome reads the directions to make insulin and then produces actual insulin. So this is insulin message. This is actual insulin. Okay, so the ribosome reads the message and then spits out insulin. Okay, it's much more complicated than that, um, but that's, the, that's a very short version of protein synthesis, right? That was the making of a protein. Okay, the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi complex could be uh, named either one of those things, Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus. Uh, it's a system of or uh, a set of um, proteins, and it's also double membrane, that's going to help um, package and process proteins. Okay, package and process proteins. What does that mean? Okay, so... Here is, I'm just going to show you a picture of it so I can make it a little more clear. So here is a Golgi apparatus, right? So here's a ribosome. Here's a ribosome. The ribosome read this little mRNA message, and it spit out this uh, protein that we call insulin, right? This insulin, um, number one, doesn't know where to go, and it, it's not yet complete yet, right? It doesn't know where um, where to go, or and, and it's not completely formed yet. This insulin is going to travel from the ribosome to the Golgi, okay, which is this big green thing. So here's my little insulin. The insulin needs to go somewhere, where in this case, it needs to go outside of the cell that it's in, and it has to go to muscle cells or the bloodstream. Okay, It's going to go into the bloodstream. So this is here. We have it in a cell, right? So here's an electron microscope image of a Golgi. And this little protein is going inside and it has to leave this cell and go into the bloodstream, right? We want it to go into the blood, right? How does this insulin know where to go? It doesn't. The Golgi has to tell it where to go. So this insulin goes into the Golgi. The Golgi basically puts it into a little package. That's why I said it packages and processes um, proteins. It puts this little protein into a little package and that package is going to tell the cell where to bring it. Okay. There are a couple of different types of packages. You can have one package that tells it to go to the nucleus. You can have another package that tells it to go to the cytoplasm, or you can have another package that tells it to go outside of the cell somewhere. And that's what this particular package is, right? So the, the Golgi is going to tell the cell where to bring this protein. Is it going to go to the cytoplasm? Is it going to go to the nucleus? Is it going to leave the cell? going to be excreted or secreted by the cell. So in, this, in my example, we're going to say that this insulin is going to go into the blood, right? So this Golgi takes this protein, it fixes it up. If it needs any fixing, if it needs to be folded or oriented in a different way, it does that. And then it puts it into a little package that we call a vesicle. Oh, it's written right there, vesicle. Okay. It's going to put this little um, protein in the vesicle and then send it on its way wherever it has to go, whether that's the cytoplasm, the nucleus, or the exterior of the cell. So that's what the Golgi does. Okay. Lysosomes. Okay. Lysosomes are tiny little organelles that are pretty much like the garbage men of the cell world. Okay, what they do is they break up and digest um, waste products within the cell, right? So they, they contain what we call hydrolytic enzymes. And those hydrolytic enzymes are things that are very acidic, okay, um, very strong acids. And these strong acids are going to help to digest things like proteins, nucleic acids, carbs, phospholipids, uh, where do, why would we say these things, right? Proteins are found in things like bacteria or viruses. Nucleic acids are found in bacteria or viruses. Carbohydrates can be the walls or membranes of bacteria and viruses. Okay, phospholipids are found in the cell membrane of bacteria. When we want to break these things down, we use lysosomes. And lysosomes are just basically like little bags of acid, right? I'm just going to put HL for hydrolytic enzymes. And these little bags of acid, you know, say they see something that they, they want to kill or destroy, they can kind of just open themselves up. Let me get a, an eraser here. They can kind of just open themselves up and then all of the contents spill out and it can destroy this into little smaller pieces, right? So if we have a bacterial infection, our lysosomes are going to help break that bacteria down, okay, things like that. Okay. 
a peroxisome is very similar to a lysosome, um, but instead of using hydrolytic enzymes, it's going to use hydrogen peroxide. Okay, it's going to be using H2O2 in order to do these things, neutralize free radicals, detoxify alcohol and other drugs, uh, could neutralize bloodborne toxins, okay, like bacteria or things like that. All right, so it does very, very similar job to the lysosome, but in a different way, different mode. Okay, then you have the mitochondria. Okay, the mitochondria is an organelle, it's an extremely important organelle for the life of an organism, and its job is to produce ATP. ATP is one of the most important chemicals in all of life, right? DNA is really important, right? Because it gives us life, okay? And it has our genetic material, okay? But the cell cannot survive without ATP. ATP is cellular energy. Cellular energy. I spelled that wrong, but that's okay. Energy, okay? If you take away ATP, the cell dies, right? You can't live without ATP. And the mitochondria is responsible for making ATP through a process called cell respiration. Okay, cell respiration or cellular respiration. And what the mitochondria does is it takes oxygen that you breathe, it takes glucose or food that you eat, and in a very, very long, complicated process, it spits out water as a waste, spits out carbon dioxide as a waste, and it produces ATP, which you use for energy, okay? And that's really all I need you to know about that. There are different parts of the mitochondria. It does have two membranes, it has an inner and an outer membrane. Okay, there's a space in the center of it called the matrix. Okay, actually the liquid that's held in the, in the center chamber is called the matrix. Okay, there are these folds which make up the chamber called the cristae. Okay, so if we have our outer membrane, then we have these folds called cristae that make up a chamber inside of it. And then it's filled with fluid and that fluid is called the matrix. And that's where this process occurs. This, this cell respiration process happens inside of the matrix um, because this matrix is full of enzymes. And those enzymes are gonna change these compounds into these compounds so that we can get energy. It's commonly called the powerhouse of the cell. Here's a mitochondria. Oh, I could have just come here instead of drawing it for you. Okay, but there it is. Okay, centrioles. Okay, centrioles are these um, small cylindrical um, structures that help during cell division. Okay, so uh, I like to call the centrioles like the Christmas lights of the cell world or the decorations of the cell world. We only take them out when they're needed. So whenever we go through a process called mitosis, we take a cell and we divide it in two and get two new cells, okay? But in order to do that, we wanna make these offspring the same as the parent, right? So this parent has DNA and we wanna make sure that the two offspring have the same DNA. But we can't split the parent's DNA in half and give half here and half here, then it wouldn't be the same, right? We wouldn't have identical um, cells. So what we have to do is we have to duplicate the DNA and then split it in half evenly between the two new cells. That's what a centriole does. The centriole is gonna pull this piece of DNA to this side. It's gonna pull this piece of DNA to this side so that each one of these new cells at the bottom has their own copy, All right? If we didn't have centrioles, then maybe these, the two pieces of DNA both end up in here. Nope. Maybe these two pieces of DNA end up in here and this one ends up with no DNA. Okay, we wouldn't want that. So the centrioles are going to be the things that pull the DNA or pull the chromosomes apart from one another uh, during cell division. And they only show up during cell division. And cell division is like 5% of the whole life cycle of a cell, okay, 5 to 10%. So we only see centrioles during that time period. It's like Christmas, right? You only see, uh, or any holiday if you don't celebrate Christmas, if, if um, I celebrate Christmas. So we only have our lights up for the month of December, really, and maybe a little bit into January, but we put them away for nine, 10 months of the year, 10, 11 months of the year. Same thing with centrioles. We keep them hidden until we need them during cell division, and then we take them out to do that. This is what a centriole looks like. It's a whole bunch of different microtubules linked together into this circle, which forms like a cylinder type of pattern. And these things are going to grab onto chromosomes and split them apart. Okay, that's it for organelles. Okay, and the next thing we wanna do is we wanna talk about transport. 
And transport is the process in which substances pass into or and out of a cell. So that's why we're kind of going with that uh, topic now, right? So we just talked about the membrane. Uh, now we want to talk about how do things get in and out of the membrane, right? And that's what this is, okay? The, the process of things going into or out of the membrane is called cellular transport, okay? And these are my personal notes. That's why it looks a little bit different than the uh, PowerPoint. The PowerPoint had a lot of information that we did not necessarily need to know. Uh, this is the this is the stuff you absolutely need to know. So what can pass through a membrane? What can pass through our cell membrane? We can have salts like NaCl. We can have gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen. We can have water. We can have vitamins like A, D, and K. Okay, bacteria can go through. Viral particles can go through. Sometimes it's not it's not necessarily what we want to go through, but it can happen. Okay, and it's our cell's job to stop it. Okay, so transport can happen in a couple of different ways, and Again, it's, it's the movement of material through our membrane, right? So we have our phospholipids here. We have our proteins that are embedded inside of our cell membrane. And the process of getting something from the outside in or from the inside out is called cellular transport. And there's a, a whole bunch of ways that we can do that, right? There's a whole bunch of ways that we can take things into and out of the cell. Okay, we talked about hydrophilic and hydrophobic already, so we're not going to talk about that. We also talked about the phospholipid bilayer, so we're not going to spend time on that anymore as well. Okay, here are the ways that we can do transport. There are two major types of transport. There's passive and active. Okay, passive and active transport. And we're going to take a look at each one of these individually. The difference between the two is that active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. Okay, active transport requires energy. Passive transport does not, okay? We do not need ATP when doing passive transport. So we're gonna break this up and we're gonna look at it separately. We're gonna look at passive and then we'll look at active. So here, all of this down here, this is all passive, okay? So passive transport is the movement of materials across a membrane without using cellular energy or, or ATP, okay? you can have three types of passive transport, okay? You can have diffusion, and we're gonna talk about each one of these individually. You can have facilitated diffusion, or you can have osmosis, okay? So diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or osmosis. Let's take a look at the definition of def uh, diffusion. Diffusion is the process by which particles move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and we can add to this until equilibrium is met. Uh, that should be uh, drawn a little bit differently. Okay, That is to until equilibrium is reached. Okay, so you've all seen diffusion happen. Um, if you've ever taken a tea bag and you put a dip a tea bag into hot water, the water was clear, right, and translucent. You could, you could see through the the, the water before you put the tea bag in. And as the tea bag steeps in the water, the water turns brown or black or, or whatever, whatever tea you're using, right? And what's happening is the tea is diffusing into the water. It's going from where it's higher concentrated, right? So if I have a teacup here, and here's my tea bag, right? This is nice and clear, and there's no tea in here. It's just water. There's tea concentrated inside of the tea bag. And when you dip the tea bag into the water, where's the where's the higher concentration of tea? In the bag, right? So here's my tea bag. Okay, there's higher concentration in the bag. There's lower concentration in the water. So the tea is going to diffuse from where it's highest to where it's lowest. It's going to leave the tea bag and go into the water until equilibrium is until the water is completely the same color in all parts of the water. Right? It all becomes that that reddish, brownish color, whatever you call it, if you're using just regular black tea. Okay, that's normal diffusion. Going from an area of higher concentration, that's what these brackets mean, concentration, to an area of lower concentration. Everything in the world does this, okay? Weather is high concentration, low concentration. It's high pressure to low pressure, right? That's how we get uh, different types of weather patterns, okay? Cold goes from high pressure to low pressure. Or, uh, I mean, um, temperatures go from, you know, high to low, okay? 
whenever something is in higher concentration, it wants to go to where it's lesser concentrated. It moves, okay? Facilitated diffusion is the same exact thing as regular diffusion, except it needs some help. And in this case, it needs help by a protein channel, okay? There's a, we looked at the different things that are embedded inside the cell membrane. One of them was called a protein channel. I called it a doggy door before, right? Um, certain things are just too big to fit through the membrane through diffusion, right? So things, there are certain things that can fit through the cell membrane just by simply diffusing through it, right? Very, very small things can fit through very easily. But there are some things that are slightly bigger that can't fit through necessarily, right? If you were moving, you know, uh, into a new house and you had a shoebox, you could put that shoebox through a window in the house, okay? You can't necessarily put a TV through the window in the house. You might have to go through the front door, right? So that front door would be a protein channel, okay? So it's the same thing as diffusion, except it needs a little bit of facilitation, needs a little bit of help. So we call that facilitated diffusion and the help comes in the form of a protein channel, okay? The last type of um, passive transport is called osmosis. And osmosis is the same thing as diffusion, but you're specifically talking about H2O. You're specifically talking about water moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. That's all it is. So if, you're, if, if you have anything moving from higher to lower concentration, we call that diffusion. If it's water doing that, you call it osmosis. Okay, if water is doing it, it's called osmosis. Okay, so if you have a, a, a dry sponge and you put that sponge into a puddle, right? And that water gets sucked up into that sponge, that's called osmosis. Okay, the water is doing the movement. The water is going into the sponge. So we call it osmosis. Here, the tea was moving into the water, so we called it diffusion. The water wasn't moving, the tea was. Okay. Okay. Here is a video, really quick little video. So let's take a watch. What is diffusion? Ever wonder how substances move around the body or how a metabolite gets in and out of the cell or how perfume spray spread the aroma around in a matter of seconds from the corner you spray it in to the rest of your room? Diffusion is to be blamed. Yes. It is the kind of transport in which dissolved substances or particles move from region of higher concentration to lower concentration with no external energy involved. Since this transport does not require energy from external source, it is also called passive transport. Diffusion occurs when particles, gases, or dissolved substances are mobile or free to move as they spread from where they are in high concentration to the region where they are in low concentration throughout the concentration gradient. The concentration gradient is an environment in which particles are distributed in different concentrations, keeping high concentration region on one side and low concentration on the other side. In the human body, the blood takes oxygen using this simple mode of passive transport in which oxygen moves from alveolar air spaces in which it happens to be in higher concentration to the blood where it is used to be in lower concentration. It can also be conceived as the mode of transport in which substances move from region of abundance to the region of demand where their concentration is lower. Cells use a bit different yet sophisticated kind of diffusion. They use some carrier proteins to take in the required substance of nutrients. And since this mode involves facilitation of these proteins to allow these substances inside the cell through the membrane, this kind of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion. An important example is that of blood. Oxygen binds with red blood cells in the bloodstream through facilitated diffusion, which gives us oxygenated blood. Okay, so hopefully that helped a little bit. I guess the same thing that I said, we were just taking um, things from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. What is... Okay, now active transport, on the other hand, is basically the same as passive transport, but there are two different things that we need to know. With active transport, one, we need ATP present, okay? We have to have ATP 
in order for this to work. Now, why is that? That's the main thing. <clears throat> why do we need ATP? We need ATP because we're going against a concentration gradient. Okay, so the concentration gradient, which normally would be high to low, and if you think of a of a hill, okay, if there's a boulder on a hill and you want to push the boulder down, the boulder goes very easily down the hill. You don't need energy, so this would be passive, right? But if it was active transport, and you start at the bottom of a hill, and you need to push the boulder up, it requires a lot of energy, right? So you're not going from high to low in active transport. You're actually going from low to high concentration. And that's why we need energy, OK? In passive, you're starting high, going low. In active, you're starting low and going high, which requires the use of ATP. So we, we're going to need uh, some proteins to help us do that, and we're going to need um, some ATP to help us do that. Okay, so check out this video. This is a video of what we call the sodium potassium pump. Okay, now the person in the video is going to be saying um, some things uh, courtesy of this channel, whatever that channel is. Okay, and only thing I need you to know, okay, there's going to be a lot of things that are said that we don't need to know, but and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk over it as well. Okay. <clears throat> the sodium. Okay, so here we have our cell membrane, and here I'm just going to pause it real quick. Here we have an embedded protein. Right now, this embedded protein has a, a shape. It has a what we call an orientation. Right, and you can see on the inside there are different shapes. Inside you have triangular shapes and rounded shapes. This protein is called the sodium potassium pump. It's going to pump sodium and potassium against their gradients, right? So if there's more sodium outside than inside, it's gonna go against the gradient, right? It's gonna, it's gonna continuously um, do this pump where it pumps sodium out and uh, potassium in or vice versa. We're gonna see that when certain molecules bond to this protein, ATP is needed in order for this protein to open in the opposite direction and then allow for the flow in the opposite direction. So let me just hit play and we'll show you what happens. Okay, so we're gonna see in a moment some sodium, here we got some sodium, come in and bond to the protein here, okay? Then we need energy. So here's ATP, let me pause it. This is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, A, and then three Ps, triphosphate, three Ps, okay? When this energy, or how, how do you use energy? You take ATP and you cleave off one of the phosphates, and this will leave with only two phosphates attached to it instead of three, and that's essentially what we call chemical energy. And when that happens, this protein is going to change its shape and open up on the other side, allowing the sodium to exit the cell, and then it will, it will return to its shape when potassium, the Ks, bond to it and go back into the cell. So I'm going to hit play now so you can see that. Okay, here's our energy. It leaves as ADP, adenosine diphosphate. The shape of this protein changes and releases sodium to where it's um, even greater, right? So we're going from low inside to high outside against the gradient. Now, in order for this to go back to normal, we need uh, potassium, which is K, the little blue cubes. They have to come in. And once they bond, its orientation will change back to normal. The energy leaves, and this potassium can get um, put into the cell. This goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, and this is a type of transport, but because it needed energy for this protein to change its shape, we call that active transport. Okay, so that's the only difference between the two. The last thing we want to talk about is what we call bulk transport, okay, bulk transport. And bulk transport deals with items that are too large to enter the cell by diffusion, and they're also too large to enter the cell through active transport. 
these things aren't necessarily molecules. They could be entire cells or they could be large macromolecules. Okay. They would, that's the big thing here is that they're large and we're doing it in bulk. Kind of like when you go to Costco, right? If you went to just a supermarket, you can buy a can of tuna. You go to Costco, you gotta buy six cans of tuna, right? It's in bulk. So there are two types of bulk transport. There is endocytosis, which could also be called phagocytosis, which is the movement of solids <clears throat> across a membrane. And then you have pinocytosis, which is endocytosis again, but it's the movement of liquid. Okay, now endo, the term endo, E-N-D-O, means to enter. So whenever something does endocytosis, no matter if it's phagocytosis of solids or pinocytosis of liquids, it's always things moving into the cell. Okay, that's what enter means. Okay, and how do you remember between solid phago and liquid pino? Think of wine, right? Pinot Grigio, um, pino is liquid, wine is liquid. Okay, so it goes with that. Okay, so whenever something enters the cell in large bulk and it's a solid, that is endocytosis called phagocytosis. Whenever it's a liquid, that is a type of endocytosis, which is pinocytosis. Okay. Now how these take it in, how the cell um, takes bulk transport in, is it actually uses its membrane, it uses its phospholipids to surround the thing that it wants to engulf and create a vesicle around it. And I'm going to show you a video of this as well. Okay. But what if we want to do the opposite? What if we want to release something? Okay, this was en things entering the cell. But what if we wanted to release something? Okay, if we want to release something, we call it exocytosis. Hold on one sec. Where's my definition of exocytosis? Do I not have it here? Nope, it's okay. I'll just write it down. The opposite of endocytosis is called exocytosis. Exocytosis. Okay, EX means to exit, right? So it's the opposite of endocytosis, it's exocytosis. And we don't have any of these terms for exocytosis. We only talk about pino and phagocytosis when talking about the taking in of things during endocytosis. When we wanna get rid of something, doesn't matter if it's solid or liquid, we're gonna just call it exocytosis. So this is the uh, movement of material outside or exiting the cell. And it does so by using a vesicle that's inside and releasing it outside of the cell. And I'm going to show you a picture of that or a video of that now. Okay, so here we have a, a drawing of phago and pinocytosis, which are the types of endocytosis. And here we have a solid particle. So this, this could be a bacterial cell. <clears throat> it could be a large macromolecule. And we want to get it inside, right? So it's outside. We want to get it inside. Okay, that's step three. In between it being outside and inside, what's going to happen is the cell itself, the, here's the cell membrane, the cell is actually going to wrap itself around the particle. And eventually it's going to keep wrapping and wrapping and wrapping until it gets all the way around it and then pinches off. And then this part of the cell membrane that was part of the cell's uh, plasma membrane is now a vesicle or a vacuole that is now surrounding the solid particle that we wanted in. Okay, so over here, same thing, but it's instead of it being a solid, it's liquid. Okay, we wanted to get one of these um, solutes in the solution inside. Okay, we surround it, we engulf it, we close it off, it becomes a vesicle inside the cell. Okay, so now I just want to show you a quick video, which I will, I will talk over to show you guys what's going on. So I love this video. Even though it's a very old video, it's it's um, it's graphics aren't great, but I'm a big fan of it. So here we have a cell. Here's a nucleus. Here's our cytoplasm. Here's our membrane, right? Here's our cell membrane on the outside. And we have a solid uh, particle that we want to bring in, right? So this is a phagocytosis, right? And this particular um, cell is going to be engulfed by the cell membrane of this cell. This could be a white blood cell. White blood cells do this all the time, right? So this is phagocytosis or a type of endocytosis happening in this white blood cell. And the membrane will surround it until it completely forms a vesicle around it. Now this vesicle could be used for something else. Here's liquid, 
or you do, again, we're doing the same thing. We're surrounding it with our cell membrane. And you might be saying to yourself, well, if this cell membrane keeps pinching off like that, isn't the cell going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller? And you are correct, but we also talked about an organelle earlier in the lecture that makes phospholipids that can replace the ones that are being used to form these vesicles, right? And that was the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So if we keep watching here, we can see a much more of an up-close version of this, okay? And we can see that the cell membrane kind of pinches and now becomes part of this vesicle. Here's exocytosis. So we're starting with the vesicle inside. So let's say we made this. Let's say these are antibodies. Let's say this maybe this is insulin. Okay, and we want to uh, secrete these out of the cell. All right, we want to get the. We made them here. We uh, used our mRNA. We gave that mRNA to our, our rough ER. A protein was made. The Golgi apparatus put this together. Right, the Golgi would be the thing that puts this vesicle together with these proteins in it. And now it wants to send it outside of the cell. Well, it covers it. The Golgi is going to cover it in a vacuole or a vesicle made of phospholipids. Why? Because the cell membrane is made of phospholipids. And if this is phospholipids, they can kind of merge together. If you've ever put two pieces of clay together or two pieces of Play-Doh, because they're the same material, they will combine if you squeeze, you know, squish them together. Same thing here. Because this vesicle is made of phospholipids and the membrane is made of phospholipids, they will actually become uh, united when, when, they, when they touch. So watch, let me just clear this off. Okay, so when I hit play on this, you'll see that they become one piece and whatever was inside of that vesicle gets, gets discarded outward into the intracellular fluid. And that's exocytosis. So that's the end of the slideshow and the lecture. If you have any questions, make sure to comment in the sec uh, comment section or you can email me and I'll see you next time. Bye.